All right, trig students, uh, 10.3 is our uh, last topic for the class. We are going to review complex numbers and how polar coordinates can be helpful in analyzing complex numbers. Let's begin with uh, just a review in general of the, of the imaginary number i. If, recall, if you recall, i is a number that when you square it, you get the real number negative 1. In other words, you could define i as being the square root of negative 1. This is useful for finding solutions to equations that have no real solutions, but they still have mathematical solutions. For example, we have x squared plus 4 is equal to 0. A common strategy here would be to isolate the x squared, and that produces a negative 4 on the other side. Now, there are no real numbers that when you square them, you get a negative real number back. Like if you square a positive, you get a positive. If you square a negative, you get a positive again. But we can expand the number system to include uh, what's called the complex number system. And it's a little unfortunate that we call them imaginary numbers as if they have no meaning. Uh, they have meaning in the same sense that negative numbers have meaning. We just have to expand our definition of what a number is and uh, apply certain axioms and rules to work with it and we can create mathematical sense of statements. Anyway, the square of x is equal to negative 4 can be accomplished if we involve the imaginary number i. So x is equal to, we have two different answers here, plus or minus the square root of negative 4. And then to break this down uh, further, You would square root the negative 1 and square root the 4 separately, because you can think of negative 4 as negative 1 times 4, and then square root the pieces separately. And uh, that will give us... There we go. Uh, that two solutions are x is equal to plus or minus. Uh, the square root of negative 1 is i, and the square root of two is, uh, 4 is 2. Normally we put the 2 first and the i second. But there we go. Plus or minus 2i are the two solutions to this uh, equation. Uh, a complex number <clears throat> is a number that is formed, has two parts, uh, A, which is called the real part, and then a BI, which is called the imaginary part. So you combine a real number with a coefficient times an imaginary number, where, where B itself is also a real number. And by when I say a real number, I'm talking about the you know real number line. We have 0, we have all the negatives and all the positives, including 0. This is called the real number line. And anything in the spectrum is a real number, including decimals and things like pi and e and fractions and whole numbers and integers and rational numbers, all those different kinds of numbers we've talked about so far. You know, they belong somewhere on this number line. Well, a and b are both real numbers, but when you multiply uh, b by i, then we have an imaginary component. So overall, this is called a complex number. Um, if b is 0, which is possible, then we're going to have only a, and our complex number is also a real number, meaning that real numbers fall within the class of complex numbers. So if this circle represented all, all the real numbers, then the complex numbers would be bigger. They'd be inclusive. Because anything that's in the real is also in the complex. If you want to say non-real, then you should say non-real. Don't say complex to mean non-real. You can also say imaginary to mean non-real. And when I say um, imaginary or non-real, you know I'm referring to this this ring here, this outer ring, that's not real but still complex. Oops, and that happens when. Um, when b is non-zero. If b is not zero, then we have an i component involved. If a is zero, if this part isn't there, then we have what's called a purely imaginary number, a purely imaginary complex number. All right, just some, some terms. Anyway, if you were to add two complex numbers of the form a plus bi, it's uh, rather quite straightforward. I'm pretty sure you're comfortable with doing this already from a college algebra class, but you just add the imaginary part, sorry, the real parts to get negative 1, and then you add the two imaginary parts. So you do 3i minus 5i, that's minus 2i. And there's our, our result. For subtraction, the only extra thing to be careful about is make sure you distribute this negative, <clears throat> and then you can just add. 
So this will be 2 plus 3. So the two real parts, this part and that part, will be 2 plus 3. So we'll get a 5. <clears throat> then we're going to have a 3i. Right, We have this 3i here. And this is going to wind up being plus 5i after you distribute the negative. So we'll have 8i total. Right, so that's the only catch when you're doing uh, subtraction is just make sure you distribute that negative. Multiplication, you just do the FOIL process. You do 2 times negative 3, so we get negative 6. Then 2 times negative 5i, that's negative 10i. And then we do 3i times negative 3 is negative 9i. And then finally, 3i times negative 5i is negative 15. And don't forget to multiply the i's as well, so 15i squared. So we just do our, our typical FOIL process, and we get this result. Then we gather like terms, and we also recall that i squared is equal to uh, negative 1. So this right here, that's a minus 1. Let's write it this way. That'll become just a, a minus 1. So really, this will be plus 15. And we have this minus 6. So combining those, that gives us a plus 15 minus 6 is a positive 9. And then we combine the two imaginary parts negative 10i minus 9i is negative 19i. All right, so that's that's pretty straightforward. We just move that down a little bit. We just FOIL, and then remember that i squared is equal to negative 1, and then combine similar parts. Uh, division is... Uh, to accomplish division, we're actually going to uh, make real the denominator. <coughs> To make a complex number real, at least one way to do it, is to multiply that complex n number. So I'm going to multiply this, this fraction, top and bottom, by what's called the complex conjugate of the denominator, which is the real part you keep the same, so minus 3 and minus 3, but the imaginary part you change the sign. So we went from negative 5i to positive 5i. And this complex number here, negative 3 plus 5i, is said to be the complex conjugate of this complex number. In other words, they're complex conjugates of each other, you know, vice versa. You can say one is the complex conjugate of the other, and vice versa. Now, whenever I, I multiply a... If I'm trying to... I'm not trying to change this fraction. I'm just trying to rewrite it in a different way. It's kind of like saying if you have... Uh, one third, and you want to change this uh, to some other expression, but that's the same. You can multiply it by two over two and say it's two sixths, right? But that's because two over two is equal to one, and multiplying by one doesn't change the value of something, although we've clearly changed the appearance of it, right? Because we started with one third and I wound up with two sixths. So they don't look alike, but they have the same value. We're going to use the same strategy here. Whatever I multiply uh, the bottom by, I need to multiply the top by the same thing, otherwise, I change the value, right? Because this fraction right here is equal to 1. And multiplying by 1 doesn't change its value. But this will change the way this looks. Uh, okay, and then from, from here, let me actually uh, shrink this down a little bit so that I have some room to do the work I need to do here. Get those pushed over. Okay. You can... Uh, Identify, so look to the denominator, put its complex conjugate right there, and then do the put that same thing up there. Now we just do a bunch of foiling. We're going to see what happens. So 2 times negative 3, we get uh, negative 6 to begin. All right, plus 10i, minus 9i. And then finally, that times that is positive 15i squared. Okay, this will be all over. Now let's FOIL the denominator. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Negative 3 times 5i is negative 15i. And we have positive 15i here. And then finally, we have negative 25i squared. Don't forget the i squared. Students forget that often. Alright, so I foiled and I foiled. 
Then you remember that uh, you use the com the fact that i squareds, right? That'll be just come negative one, and this i squared will be the same. And we start combining similar terms. Let's focus on the top first. More trash cans outside. Sorry if you can hear all this this noise. Hopefully it's not too distracting, but it won't last long. So this, looking at the top, we have a negative 6, and this is going to wind up being minus 15. So we have negative 21. Oops. Then we combine the 10i and the negative 9i. That's going to be just positive i. And then we're done with the, with the numerator. Uh, the denominator we have, uh, well, the i's are going to cancel, right? The, Negative 59 and the positive 59 will cancel each other. This always happens when you multiply uh, conjugates. In fact, if ever you multiply something of this structure, where the first one's the same and the second one is opposite sign, you always wind up getting um, oops, cancellation of the two middle terms from the FOIL process, right? Just a squared will be there. The a, b, and negative a, b will cancel, but then you get minus b squared, right? You get a difference of squares. And this happens in the when multiplying by a complex conjugate as well. The two middle terms here are going to cancel, the negative 59, the positive 15i. So we just have to really do, now do the real parts. This will wind up really being a plus 25, and we have this 9. So we have 34 total. Then what you could do, so this is considered done. This is now a new complex number. It, if you'd like, you can split the 34 up and write this like this way, just so that you can see the, the structure of A plus BI. Right? We just have a new complex number, where A is this fraction, B is this fraction, and then we have the I. All right, in each case, um, oper these four operations on complex numbers are said to be closed meaning that when you take a complex number and you add another complex to number to it, you get a complex number back. Of course, the i's don't have to be there for me to say that it's a complex number. Add any two complex numbers, you get a complex number. Subtract any two complex numbers, you get a complex number. Multiply any two complex numbers, you get a complex number. And divide any two complex numbers, you get a complex number. That's what it means when we say that the complex numbers are closed under the four operations. The operations can't produce something that's no longer a complex number. Now, that doesn't mean that i will be there, right? It is possible to add two uh, complex numbers that have imaginary parts and to get something that doesn't have any imaginary parts, right? So when I say complex, do not think that that means i has to be there, right? Complex is inclusive of real numbers as well as non-real numbers. All right, uh, so that's a review of working with complex numbers. Now we're going to introduce something maybe that's new to you, something called the complex plane. Every complex number has two parts. It has the real part and the imaginary part. Well, you can plot that as a point, if you will. If you think of the real part as being the x-coordinate and the imaginary part, at least the coefficient, being the y-coordinate. We call this the real and imaginary axis. We're going to plot a few of these uh, complex numbers over here in the complex plane. So 2 plus 3i. You would simply go, uh, so that the real real part's 2, so go to the go to 2 on the real axis. And then the coefficient of the imaginary part is 3, positive 3. So then you go up to positive 3, and you put this right there. And let's give some, oops. Let's call these different things. We have complex number A, complex number B, complex number C, etc. just so I can put a simple letter up here. So there's there's complex number A. 2 plus 3i would be in that position. Complex number B is 3 minus i. So we would go you know out 3 and then down 1, because negative i is a coefficient of negative 1. Right, so here would be complex number B. Complex number C is uh, negative 2 and then a positive 2i. So go left 2, up 2. And here's complex number C. Complex number D is uh, left 1, down 4. It's down here. 
uh, complex number E is purely imaginary. So it has no real part. Its real part is zero. So, so stay at zero on the real axis, but then go down to negative two. So here would be uh, complex number E. It'd be on the imaginary axis. Right, all the complex numbers that are purely imaginary, meaning they have no real part, <clears throat> or the real part is zero, are going to be you know somewhere on the imaginary axis. Whereas the last point, our complex number f, is purely real. It doesn't have an imaginary part, but it's still a complex number, but also a real number. And it's at location four, so it's right, right there. So this real axis, all points on there have no imaginary part. In fact, that axis alone is our traditional real number line. Like when I say, okay, here's zero, here's one, etc. Here's a negative 2.1. We're just talking about points that are somewhere along this real axis. So you could argue that a complex number is kind of like a two-dimensional number. It not only has a, a one-dimensional uh, component along this axis, but it has a second dimensional component. So that's an interesting thought, is that complex numbers are two-dimensional numbers. All right, and that's the complex plane. It's uh, really that simple in plotting a complex number. And again, if that point is on that horizontal axis, that also just means that the complex number is also a real number, that there is no imaginary part. This is going to provide sort of like a visual way to help make complex numbers that are not real, make them real. Like, like what would you need to do to A to make it real? Well, if you can somehow shift it down to the real axis, that would make it real. So get rid of the imaginary component, right? Like strike that part there and it would make it a real number. We're going to learn um, some other ways to turn complex numbers back into real numbers, how to move them somewhere to the real axis line. Complex numbers have a polar form. So... If you have um, a complex number, z equals a plus bi, then we're going to define the magnitude of that complex number as to be how far away it is from the origin of this, of this image. All right, this is, we're going to say, is the magnitude of z. Now, this... This, we typically, we use Z to stand for complex numbers, but you know any letter will work. But let's just use Z to stand for complex. And when I talk about the magnitude of Z, its uh, notation is putting uh, Z in what appear to be absolute value bars. It's really what the R was in our polar coordinates. Also, the magnitude of a complex number is only positive or zero. If the complex number is at the origin, then its magnitude is zero. But if the complex number is anywhere else, it's going to have a positive magnitude. Um, all right, so we're going to have a positive magnitude. And the, if you're to make a right triangle out of this, I'm just going over the formula now, then the real part and the imaginary part, at least the coefficients, just the a and the b, right? Leave the i off when you're, when you're looking at the imaginary coefficient here. You don't need to put the i here as well. But the a and b would be the legs of that triangle. And so you can find the magnitude by doing the Pythagorean theorem. And so the magnitude is... It's going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. And the magnitude will always be bigger than or equal to zero. So we don't ever keep the negative. Unlike in polar coordinates where sometimes you have a negative r, we're going to say that the magnitude of a, of a, um, a complex number is a non-negative result. So it's either zero or positive. Uh, the argument of the complex number is uh, the theta that in standard position of the trajectory that takes us from the origin to that complex number. So we again, we know that the tangent of theta, whatever theta is, will be the opposite, which is b, over the adjacent, which is a. So it'll just be b over a. 
This is what we'll use to help find thetas. Now, I, I don't write this as theta isolated. Like, I don't want to say that this is our formula to always find theta, like to do an arctangent, because as, arct as soon as you use arctangent, we get limited results, and theta might need to be obtuse. It might need to be a positive angle that's more than 90 degrees. And so I hesitate, so we don't say that, hey, to find theta, always do the same thing. But it, whatever theta is, this will be a true statement. Finding theta will require sometimes adjusting the arctangent, sometimes leaving it depending on where the theta actually is. But let, so the argument can be found using that the fact that the tangent of theta is b over a. Okay, so the next part, uh, borrowing again what we did, uh, let's call this b again and this a. We know that uh, b can be found by doing the magnitude of the um, polar, so in other words, the length of the hypotenuse, if you will, times the sine of the argument. Right, this is just our b equals r sine theta that we did back when we did polar conversion. Get rid of that. And the A could be expressed as the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude times the cosine of theta. Remember, these just come from the simple statements. Like, look at the data right here. If I do the cosine of theta, that's going to be adjacent, which is A, divided by hypotenuse, which is magnitude of Z. And then I just multiply the magnitude of Z to that side, and I get A equals magnitude of Z times cosine theta, right, this statement. Similarly, I could produce the statement for B. All right, so our our polar uh, point here uh, could be expressed as uh, a plus not, not polar, sorry, our complex number could be expressed as a plus b i, and I just have to replace a with the magnitude of the complex number times the cosine of theta, and then replace the b with the magnitude of the complex number times sine theta. And then, of course, we still have times an i. Make sure that times in an i is after you do sine theta. So don't think of theta times i and then do sine of that. And then we can do a little bit of factoring here. And we can express this, therefore, as... In fact, let me bring this down here. Factor out the magnitude of the complex number times... And then we just have cosine of theta plus, and then to avoid this potential confusion, I'm going to put the i in front, so plus i sine theta. This is called the polar form of a complex uh, number. z is equal to its magnitude times the cosine of the argument plus i times the sine of the argument. All right, let's uh, do this first example here. Express the complex number in polar form. It's always nice to do a, a little image to see in which quadrant our polar, our complex number is in. And this doesn't have to be extremely detailed, just it's good to know what quadrant we're in. Uh, we go negative two and then up i. So we're gonna go you know, left two and up one essentially. And this is our uh, location of our complex number. And with a real axis and an imaginary axis. All right, so we're going to want to figure out what the magnitude of this is. And you know, let's make this a little bit smaller. And figure out what the argument is. These are the, the components we're trying to figure out for this problem. So maybe I could make this a little bit bigger to help. Oh. Okay, goodness. Just do what I say. There we go. And let's shrink that. Crap, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, here we go. Uh, we just got to find out what the magnitude is and then figure out what the theta is. And then we uh, can write our polar number 
sorry, our complex number in this form instead, once you figure out what this is and what this is. Let's start with the, the magnitude. That's the easiest part. Well, if this was a little right triangle, right, I mean, you, would, you went left 2 and up 1, and you were just you know, trying to find the hypotenuse, essentially. So the magnitude is just going to be the square of the two legs added together, and then take the square root of that. Well, in other words, the a and the b. The b in front of, you know, the, the b in front of here is a 1 implied, so maybe this is good to specify that the a in this problem is minus 2, and the b is positive 1. So the magnitude of this complex number will be the square root of a squared plus b squared. Don't like that square root. It's better. a squared is going to be uh, 4. Let me go ahead and actually write this in. Negative. There's a squared plus b squared. So we get 4 plus 1, that's 5. And we get the magnitude is the square root of 5. Now we want to find... the uh, theta. Well, we know that the tangent of theta is equal to b over a. This is going to give us a negative result, though. It's, this is negative 1 half. So when I do an arc tangent, I'm not actually going to get theta. But I'm going to put a theta here. We're going to have to adjust our arc tangent. When I arc tangent a negative number, that's going to give me an angle right here, a negative number in the fourth quadrant. So I need to add 180 to this, right? just like we did in our, if you look back at our uh, lesson from 10.1, we had to do something very similar. So theta will be found by doing the arc tangent of negative 1 half, but then adjusting that by adding 180. That'll give us a, a positive angle over there pointing into the second quadrant, which is what we want it to do. Let's go ahead and use Desmos to do this part. Make sure that we're in degrees, or you can do radians if you like, but let's work with degrees. I'm going to do arc, I'm going to type in arc tangent of negative one half and then add 180 to that. So let's start with the 180, 180 plus, and then arc tangent of negative one half. So we get 153.4, we'll say, about 153.4 degrees. Okay, once you've identified what the magnitude is, which is radical 5, and what the angle, the argument is, which is 154.3 degrees, then we can express this polar or sorry, this complex number in polar form. So we have uh, 2 minus i, or negative 2 plus i, that was our example, can be written as the square root of 5 times, right, I'm just following this, the magnitude of the complex number, times the cosine of theta, plus i times the sine of theta. And I have run out of room. Didn't give myself enough space to write in here. Let me put the degree sign there. And that is uh, how we do this. Now, I should probably not put an equal sign here. Since we did some rounding to get this angle, then you know, this is about equal to that. All right, and that is how we take any complex number and we express it in polar form. Got to find its magnitude and find its argument. All right, next picture here is uh, multiplying complex numbers in polar form. So let's say we have two different, uh, we have a z and a w. They each represent a complex number. They're written in polar forms. So z is equal to its magnitude times cosine alpha plus i sine alpha, where alpha is its argument. 
And W is equal to its magnitude times uh, cosine of beta plus I sine beta, where beta is its argument. When you multiply these two expressions, I'll take a moment and rewrite. times, and then the other one, magnitude of w, times cosine of beta plus i sine beta. Um, with the multiplication, this is, there's really four things being multiplied here, and you can rearrange the order, so we can multiply the two magnitudes together first, and put that in the front. So magnitude of the first one times magnitude of the second one, and then let's uh, put this and this side by side in FOIL. So we're going to do cosine times cosine. Let's see what we wind up getting. We get cosine of alpha times cosine of beta plus i. I'll put the i in front. And then we have cosine of alpha times sine beta. Then we have i sine alpha cosine beta, and then finally, the last part of FOIL, we have I squared, and we have sine alpha sine beta. All right, so I just put the magnitudes together in the front, and then I uh, FOIL the other two parts. Now, this looks like a big mess right now, but watch what's going to happen here. We're going to use some trig identities that we learned back in Chapter 8. And we're also going to use the fact that we have an i squared sit, sitting right here. And that's the same thing as negative 1. So I'm going to group the this real part. This is a real number because it has no i. And this is going to be a real number because the i squared goes to negative 1. So I'm going to put those together. And let's do this by just uh, copying and pasting a bunch of things. So I'm going to let's get rid of this that orange there. I'm going to start with that. It's going to be there. Then this one here will be present. Oops, that's not the right piece. Mm, not sure what happened right there. Grab you, copy. There we go. It's going to be subtraction, though, this time, right, between, because the i squared goes to negative 1. Now I'm going to uh, copy the other pieces that have i attached, and I'm going to have the i factored out. So let's say plus i, and then start some parentheses. So this part here had an i attached to it. And uh, this part right here had an i attached to it. and they are being added together. Okay, so I just re I gathered the uh, real parts together and the imaginary parts together and factored out the i. Now, here come the trig identities. Cosine of alpha times cosine of beta minus sine of alpha, alpha sine of beta. This is actually, a, we can use a trig identity on this. This is the same thing as doing the cosine of alpha plus beta. This is the cosine sum identity. I forget which number it is, but I'll leave it to you to look that one up. And the one in these parentheses, this is the sine of alpha plus beta identity. So what I'm able to do now is say we get the following. We just have, uh, let's see, I'm not sure why I copied that. We don't, this is a pointless row right here. We just need that. Okay, here we go. So we can say that this is equal to uh, magnitude of z times the magnitude of w times the cosine of just add the angles, 
plus I times the sine and add the angles. This is very interesting because what's revealing is that when you multiply two complex numbers, you can find the new complex number by adding their angles and multiplying their magnitudes. Because this has the basic form of, here's, uh, let's call, uh, well, this is a, a new complex number we're making here. So we, we could say this is equal to u if you want. So some new complex number we're calling u is equal to z times w. And we can say, okay, so this represents the magnitude of u, and this a plus alpha plus beta represents the argument of u. And it has the same structure, right? We have the magnitude in the front, and then cosine of the argument plus i times sine of the argument. This is your general structure for any complex number in polar form. So you can interpret a alpha plus beta as the argument of the result of the product. And the uh, product of the arguments of z and w is going to be equal to the, uh, to say argument meant magnitude. The product of the magnitudes of z and w will be equal to the magnitude of the result. And so visually, it becomes an easy thing to do is to multiply complex number when you're working in the complex plane. Uh, find a complex number that produces a positive real number when multiplied with 1 plus 2i. All right, so our, we're going to make a, a, a plot of this. In fact, I think it might be good if I, I come back to this example here. And let's put some visuals here just so we can understand visually what, what's happening here by this I identity. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of space. Oops, that didn't do anything. All right, so we, if we have, uh, let's say we have one complex number that's uh, right here, and it has a certain angle, alpha. And then you have a, a different complex number. We'll put them both in the first quadrant just to illustrate. Let's say that this was our z and this was our w. Let's make these all straight lines here. In fact, let's, I'm going to make this even bigger. I want to make this a little bit more detailed. And shrink that down. Okay, all right. Just for the sake of a, of a argument, or of a picture, let's say we have uh, z, and z is uh, two units away from the origin, and it's at an angle that is uh, 45 degrees. Okay, just as an example. And let's say w is a complex number that's uh, three units away from the origin. And it's at an angle. In fact, let me go in here and do some color coding here. Just okay. So we'll say the, the smaller angle, we'll say, is 45 degrees. And that green angle that we're seeing in there is, uh, say, 70 degrees. I'm just making numbers up. Okay. If you were to multiply these two complex numbers, the result would be a new complex number whose magnitude is found by doing the magnitudes of the w and z. So 2 times 3 would be 6. And whose argument would be add these two angles. So 70 degrees plus 45 degrees would be the new uh, argument. So, so 70 plus 45 is 115. So you would do an argument of 115, which takes us past into the second quadrant. And we would do a magnitude that's 2 times 3. So this would have, so the result of doing w times z would be out here in the second quadrant. It'd be six units away, and it would be at an argument of 145 degrees. Let's do one more angle in here. 
And let's move this out of the way. The green one is 70 degrees. And let's do a, a pink one in here. Right. That angle would be 115 degrees. So this is what this result is essentially telling us. Right? When you multiply two complex numbers, you get another complex number, and that position of that complex number, it's you multiply right the magnitudes of the two ones you started with, so you get six units away, and then you add the arguments to get the new argument. So it's pretty cool. We have a visual interpretation of what it means to multiply two complex numbers. You know, before we did that, when just uh, if we go back to here and just say, hey, multiply two complex numbers, right? We had a process for doing this, and we got a result, but there was no cool visual connection about how to go from one to the other. Like, what was the result of multiplying two complex numbers? What's happening? Here, this gives us a cool visual about what's happening. Okay, so using that, we can now accomplish this task. Find a complex number that produces a positive real number when multiplied with 1 plus 2i. Let's begin by making a plot of where 1 plus 2i is. And then we'll strategize how to make it real through multiplication. All right, so 1 plus 2i is up in here. All right, I went over 1, right 1, and up 2. But it's really just going to be useful to know what its uh, argument is. So this is our trajectory. Oops, let me make a straight line out of this. It really doesn't matter to me what the uh, what the uh, magnitude is, because if I want to turn, if I want to make this complex number become a real number by multiplying it by something, then all that really matters to me is that I wind up somewhere on the real axis line. That's how you make a real number. Is you get that point down to that line. To do this by addition would be easy, right? If I said, hey, here's 1 plus 2i, and I say, hey, add something to this so that the i's cancel, you would say, oh, just re add to that negative 2i. Then those cancel, you get 1. That effectively just moves that point straight down and puts it right there, and that makes it real. All right, but, oops. But our goal, here we go, is to uh, do this through multiplication, not through addition. Let's go ahead and find out what this angle is, what the argument here is. We'll call that theta. And in this problem here, the a is 1 and the b is 2. And we know that the tangent of theta is equal to b over a. Now, in this case, uh, theta is a positive first quadrant angle. So the arc tangent will give us the correct answer. I don't need to adjust this answer. OK, let's go to Desmos, do arc tangent of 2 effectively. Uh, arc tangent of 2. So we get 63.4, we'll say, about 63.4 degrees. Is that right, the right number? 63.4? Yeah, okay. 63.4 degrees is our theta. Um, okay, so knowing that we can call our given point, our given complex number z, let's say. We're trying to find another complex number so that when you multiply these, the imaginary parts will go away. Well, knowing that when you multiply two complex numbers, the, the, the two arguments just add to each other, right? Like in this case here, when I had an argument of 45 and an argument of 70, when I multiply them, I got an argument of 115 degrees. Right, they just add. Well, if if you want the result to be on the x-axis, then you want the uh, angle of the result to be either zero or 180. Right? Because if you're if you're on the x-axis, then your argument is either zero if you're pointing this direction, or if you're on the x-axis over here, then your argument will be 180. All right, so we want to produce a real number that's positive. So I want to find a result that's somewhere on the positive side. I want the new argument to be 0. 
<clears throat> is an angle of zero would be on the positive x-axis. All right, so if the original had this angle, then I want my w, the argument of w, I don't really care what the magnitude of w, but I want w to have an argument so that when added to this argument, I get zero degrees. In other words, it needs to be the opposite of it. We want w to have an argument, which we can also just say, hey, the argument of w, this is what this notation means. We want the argument of w to be the opposite of this one here. In other words, uh, to be exactly the the uh, negative of the arctangent of 2. This is the exact angle I want my uh, w to have. In other words, if I were just to pick a uh, point that was in the fourth quadrant and rotated negative theta, I take any, let's try to make this look symmetrical, Right? If this was our, our z in the first quadrant, we need to pick a w that's down here in the fourth quadrant. And it really doesn't matter what its magnitude is. You just really need this, this angle to be right, right. We need this to be negative theta. If I pick a w that's somewhere down there in the fourth quadrant with that negative theta trajectory, and then when I multiply z and w, those two thetas will, come, will add, the two arguments will add, and since they're opposites, opposites of each other, they will cancel out and you will wind up with the resulting angle that is zero. In other words, <clears throat> the result will be on the positive x-axis, on the positive real axis. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so there's some obvious choices for what to pick here. To guarantee we wind up with the same angle, but in the negative but rotating clockwise into the fourth quadrant, you could just keep the same real part, but just change the sign of the imaginary part. And just like that, look, we, we reason through this sort of geometry of complex numbers, if you will, that if I multiply z by its complex conjugate, I should produce a positive real number. Now this, actually, this isn't news to a lot of you. We already, we already knew that back when we did uh, complex numbers uh, briefly in a college algebra course. In fact, we kind of did it up here already when I did the division. Right? This was a strategy. I wanted to turn this complex number into a real number, so I multiplied by its conjugate, and notice that wound up turning it into 34. It turned it into a positive real number. So this isn't a, a new realization happening here, but now we're just coupling this with a geometric interpretation because this z and this w will have opposite signed arguments. If one has an argument of 63.4 degrees, then the other one will have an argument of negative 63.4 degrees. And when you add those arguments together, they zero out. So the result should be argument zero, angle zero, so it should be pointing right, and that, in other words, it should be on the real axis and in the positive direction. Now, I said earlier it didn't really matter uh, what the magnitude of W was. I just picked W so that it was a perfect symmetrical image. In fact, this, this doesn't quite look right because it doesn't look about the same length. Right? If I wanted to be finicky, I would... And if I insisted W be the same coordinates as Z, but you now I would do something like this and move that right there. Now it looks kind of like that if Z is equal to 1 plus 2i, and then W should have some symmetry here, 1 minus 2i. Now let's, let's use this idea of canceling angles and combining magnitudes to see what z times w would be. Right? If I do z times w, and I do it the traditional, let's do it both ways, so a traditional way and using polar form. So here's the tr traditional way, just going to foil this. 1 times 1 is 1, we get minus 2i plus 2i, those will cancel, and we have minus 4i squared. And so we wind up getting, um, it's equal to... Uh, 1 plus 4, we get 5. 
I mean, that's right there. Z times W is equal to 5. And it's on the real axis. All right, well, uh, the magnitude of Z and the magnitude of W alone, right, because the, the other way is to say, okay, let, let's create a new complex number U by doing Z times W. And it should be equal to the magnitude of Z times the magnitude of W times uh, the, here we go, the cosine of the, argument of z, let's, let's put an angle in here, uh, let's call it alpha, plus i times the sine of alpha, where alpha is found by doing the argument of z plus the argument of w. Well, in other words, it's going to be uh, theta plus negative theta, right? using the this theta right here, and its opposite. But theta plus negative theta is zero. So the, the alpha is going to be zero here because the angles are opposite signs. And the magnitude of z, right? If, if z and w are, are these two choices, then the magnitude of z and the magnitude of w should be the same. And you just do uh, square root of the Pythag uh, do Pythagorean theorem. The a and b are 1 and 2. 1 squared plus 2 squared is uh, 5. And then take the square root of that. Right, so the magnitude of z is radical 5, and the magnitude of w is also radical 5. Right, that's how long these hypotenuses are. And so according to uh, the polar form, we should just multiply their magnitudes. Right, get radical 5 times radical 5 times. We get cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, and sine of 0 is 0. So notice that because the angles canceled each other and made a 0, this part here will zero out. It'll kill the imaginary part, which is why we get a real number. When the angle is zero, we get real numbers. And we get, let's call all these things here u, we get that radical five times radical five is just five, and then times one, we just get five out of this, confirming. Now you might say, well, this feels a little more complicated than just foiling, right? I, I'd rather just foil this and get my five than figure out all these magnitudes and angles and decimals and pull out calculators and have radicals to deal with. And you, you, you might be making a valid argument that one process is easier than the other, but the other one is embedded in a visual understanding of the complex numbers and how to eff effectively rotate a complex number so that it's back to being going from non-real to real. There's a geometric interpretation that this second process helps reinforce that this first process has no geometric interpretation. We don't, we're just foiling, doing algebra and trusting the results. But the other one has this idea of, you know, moving points around in the plane to, to put them in positions where I want them to be. All right, so, oh, here's an interesting uh, uh, challenge next then. Find a complex number that produces negative 5 when multiplied by 1 plus 2i. So we're starting again with 1 plus 2i. Uh, let's see what, well, I'll just redraw. I'm struggling here. Okay, this is good enough. Uh, 1 plus 2 i's, you know, up in here somewhere. This is, this is our z, z, we'll say. It's 1 plus 2 i. And we want the result, we want to multiply z by some sort of uh, w, some sort of omega, so that we will wind up with a point that's over here in negative 5. We want our u to be minus 5, and the question is what should our uh, second complex number be? So that z times w will become u. I'm calling this here theta. Okay. Well, we know that we want the argument of u uh, 
we want the argument of u to the result we want to have an argument of 180 degrees so the question is we got to come up with a second angle here for um, for our w so that when added to the theta I'll get the 180 right so the obvious choice is here we want an angle that's this much here we'll call this uh, alpha In other words, we want alpha to be 180 minus theta. So if I were to rotate alpha back into standard position, we want w to be somewhere along that path. And we want it to have an angle. Uh, let's do some color coding in here to make this a little bit easier to know what I'm labeling what. So this here, that will be theta, and we'll call this one here alpha. Okay, so we have an angle alpha, we have an angle theta, and we wanted alpha to be uh, 180 uh, minus theta. So that when you add these together, you get 180 degrees, which would be an angle, right, that puts us onto the negative real axis. In this picture, then, this angle right here is also theta. In other words, it creates, there's a symmetry here. I know that I want to put my uh, which means, you know, that these interior angles here and here are the same, right? That's, those are the same angle right there because the, the oranges are the same angle. So I need to put my W uh, somewhere along this trajectory. And this doesn't quite look symmetrical. It looks a little bit better there. We want to put W somewhere along, along here. I'm not quite sure where to put it yet. But it's got to be somewhere along this trajectory so that when um, I multiply W and Z, the two angles will add, right? The alpha and the theta will add, and that will produce 180 degrees. And so the result will be on the negative real axis. But again, the question is, how far out does this have to be along this trajectory so that the magnitude winds up being the magnitude that I want? Well, we got to, to figure that out. We have to just simply determine um, what the magnitude of z is and what the magnitude of this one is, and therefore we can determine what the magnitude of w should be. Okay. All right. So I know that the magnitude of let's do some work over here. I know that the magnitude of z is radical five. We've done that already, and I know that the magnitude of w, or sorry, of u, is just 5, right? Because u is at negative 5, so that's clearly 5 units away from the origin. But, the ma but this should be equal to uh, the magnitude of z times the magnitude of w. And if the magnitude of z is radical 5, and I'm trying to figure out the magnitude of w, if I divide by radical 5 next, and then simplify that, that's just radical 5 again. So I want w to have the same magnitude as z. So if z is radical 5 units away from the origin, then I want w to be the same thing. So we should make this look a little bit symmetrical. And bring that in. Okay, so we have, some, we have a symmetry going on here, and this w... Because of the symmetry, it's easy to get its rectangular coordinates, right? It's going to have to be left one up to. If I go left one up to, I'll be at the mirror image of Z, but over here in the second quadrant. Uh, the angles will add in such a way that they add to 180, and the magnitudes will multiply in such a way that we get, we get a magnitude of 5. Uh, let's just verify that this worked out. Um, we'll verify that it works out by multiplying the traditional way, right? So W 
times z, w is negative 1 plus 2i, and z is 1 plus, 1 plus 2i. So these are not complex conjugates of each other, right? To be complex conjugates of each other, the real parts would have to be the same, and it's the imaginary parts that would have to be opposite signed. Well, that's backwards here, so it's not correct to call these complex conjugates of each other. But they are con conjugates. Like, if you were to switch them around, one of them looks like this, the other one looks like this. These are conjugates of each other, but not complex conjugates. When we say complex conjugate, we mean that it's the imaginary part that has opposite signs. Okay, just to be clear. But they are technically still just conjugates of each other. And let's go ahead and uh, FOIL. We get negative 1, um, and then write minus 2i, and then plus 2i. So those will cancel, which is nice. And then we have plus 4i squared. Uh, then the two i's will cancel. The i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is a minus 4 over here, and there's a minus 1 there. So we get minus 5, and the i's canceled. And sure enough, yeah, we get, we get what we were looking for. Now, there's so many ways that this problem could have been done. You could have done something like this. Hey, Ed. W is what I'm looking for, and I want it to be a number so that when I multiply it with z, which is 1 plus 2i, that I get negative 5. Or you could have created this little equation like this. We're trying to find w so that when multiplied by 1 plus 2i, I, get, I just get minus 5. Which you could have said, okay, well, let me solve for w. And you do something like this, and then you uh, do what we do traditionally to div divide by you multiply by the complex conjugate. And when you do this, you should wind up getting the fact that w should be negative 1 plus 2i. I leave that to you to verify, but you know there are, there's that way to do that as well. Uh, also notice back over here, if, um, if you factored a negative out of this, it would read this. And that one up here, I, I leave the same. But notice that now we do have complex conjugates. And you FOIL those, you're going to wind up getting positive 5, but then this negative in front will give negative 5. So again, there's another way you could do that. Factor the negative out and then uh, FOIL and then put the negative back. Right? There, there's so many uh, different angles of attack, no pun intended, that you could to resolve a task like this. Okay, let's do uh, some uh, division of complex numbers. in polar form, and then one problem, and then we'll, we'll call that good. Dividing complex numbers in polar form. All right, so z divided by w, that's just the same thing as, you know, z over w. And then you can rewrite z as the magnitude of z times the cosine of alpha plus i times the sine of alpha, all over magnitude of w times uh, cosine of beta plus i sine beta. Now what I'm going to do is uh, multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate of this denominator. So I'm going to just grab that denominator, put that over here, put it up there as well. Uh, let's see, I'm missing some... No, I'm not missing anything. All right, and then make this all red just so it's consistent. All right, so I'm just multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate. Oh, it's not the conjugate yet. It's got to be minus and minus. There we go. Multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator, complex conjugate of the denominator. Oops. And let's go ahead and do the foiling process. We're just going to leave the magnitude of z over the magnitude of w. When we foil the top, we have uh, cosine of alpha times cosine of beta um, minus i sine beta cosine alpha and then plus i sine alpha cosine beta. It's really easy to get these all mixed up. Minus i squared times sine alpha sine beta. That's foiling the top. 
Foiling the bottom, we get cosine squared of beta minus i cosine beta sine beta plus i sine beta cosine beta and then minus i squared sine beta times sine beta, so sine squared beta. And that's what we get for the denominator after we FOIL. I'm going kind of fast here, but feel free to slow this down and try it for yourself and see if you get the same thing. Uh, then some miraculous things happen. In the top, I can redo my grouping. Okay, so let me... Uh, I was thinking about copying and pasting. Let me leave that off. Let's just do some copying and pasting. The real parts. So here's a real here's a part that has no i attached. Uh, and then over here, this i squared, that's going to become a negative uh, negative i squared is going to become positive one plus one. So we're going to add to that this term right here. And the operation will become plus. The other two parts uh, in the middle, right, so this part here and this part here, have i's attached. I'm going to factor the i out and then do some copying. Uh, let's see, this, let's do this one here first because it has a plus in front. And then this one here has a negative in front of that one, so we'll do that next. Of course, the i was factored out, so I've got to remove that i. Move that over a little bit, okay. All right, and then all over. And the bottom, uh, we actually get this, some nice things happening here, right? We cancellation. Those are identical, and they cancel. One's plus, one's minus. Otherwise, they're identical. And we have over here a negative i squared. That's going to become a plus one. So I'm just going to get cosine squared of beta plus sine squared of beta. And now a bunch of identities get used again. <clears throat> Turns out that these two together are the identity for cosine of alpha minus beta. Whereas this one is the identity for sine of alpha minus beta. You can go ahead and look those up. And the Pythagorean identity is down here. That's just a 1. Okay, so in the end, the interesting that happens is that you get the magnitude of z divided by the magnitude of w times... the cosine of alpha minus beta plus i times the sine of alpha minus beta. All right, the division by 1, you don't even need to write that. That just goes away. Okay, what this is showing us is that when you divide two complex numbers, the, resulting, the result will have a magnitude that is equal to the quotient of the magnitudes of the complex numbers that you divided. So if you do z divided by w, find their magnitudes and divide them, and that's how you find the magnitude of the result. And what happens to the angles is that you do subtraction of the angles instead of addition, like when we did with multiplication. So when I do um, z divided by w, it's going to produce a new complex number whose argument will be the argument of z minus the argument of w. All right, so find the complex number such that 2i divided by this complex number produces 4 minus 2i. All right, so we're going to call the one that's given here z, the one that we're producing is u, and we're trying to find, we're trying to find w. And we want to find w such that 2i, 2 plus i divided by it, so our structure is z divided by w, we want that to be equal to u.
So, I mean, there, there's, a, again, a variety of ways you could do this. The non-geometric approach would be something like, hey, multiply the w to that side, and then divide both sides by u. And you do z divided by u. You know, do this 2 plus i and divide it by this 4 minus 2i, and then simplify that back down to a complex number, and uh, you can find out what the w is. And that's one approach. But let's try to make sense of this with our geometric interpretation. So we have 2 plus i. That's going to be over here somewhere. This is our, we'll call that one z. 2 plus i. And we want it to produce 4 minus 2i. Okay, well, 4 is uh, way out here, and then minus 2i. Okay, now notice that if you look at some some triangles that are at play here, we have a triangle sitting right here that's uh, two by one, and we have a, a triangle that's here that's a four by two. These are similar. In fact, which uh, you know, if I put the two by one here, the, the the two by one would be there, and there's another two by one, etc., to create a you know a four by two here. Because of this, I know that whatever angle that we have right here, if this is, um, uh, let's call this alpha, then this one here will be negative alpha. They'll have to be the opposites of each other. Well, the question then is, well, how do I go from alpha to negative alpha by subtracting? Well, you would say, okay, well, remove 2 alpha from alpha. That would produce negative alpha. So this tells me that the, um, the w I'm after needs to have an argument of 2 alpha, knowing that when I do, you know, z divided by w, that I would do the argument of z minus the argument of w. So here's the argument of z. This needs to be the argument of w so that when I subtract them, I get the argument of the thing I'm looking for. Okay, so I know that I want W to have an argument of 2 alpha. Furthermore, we know that the magnitude of Z is equal to radical 5. The magnitude of W sorry, of u, is equal to, we do 16 squared plus 4 squared radical 20, which is 2 radical 5, which shouldn't be surprising. It should be twice as long as z because it's twice as big of a triangle. Okay, now I know that when I do uh, the magnitude of u, I should get the magnitude of z divided by the magnitude of w. And we know the magnitude of u is twice radical 5, and the magnitude of z is radical 5. So I'm tr trying to figure out what the magnitude of w is, so that this comes out correctly. All right, and so the magnitude, I'm going to do some cross multiplication here. Um, multiply by mag w uh, and then divide by 2 radical 5. We get the magnitude of w is 5 over radical 5 over 2 radical 5. Radical 5s cancel. You want the magnitude of w to just be 1 half. And you want its argument to be twice alpha.
right? So W has to be somewhere in this area. And its argument, we want it to be twice alpha. But its magnitude will only be one half. This is bad notation here. I don't know what I was thinking. Down here, this should be argument of W equals twice alpha. Okay. Um, we are going to use some technology to help us do this. We're going to figure out what alpha is, and then we're going to double it, and that's going to be our argument of W. And then we're going to create W by doing its magnitude times the cosine of its argument. Uh, let's use a, we need a, a new symbol in here. What? Well, its argument is going to be two alpha. We don't need a new symbol. It's going to be two alpha plus I times the sine of two alpha. The magnitude of W needs to be a half. And then we just got to figure out uh, what the two alphas are, and then we can uh, do the cosine of that. And then the sine of that, you could use some double angle identities here. We know the cosine of two alpha is cosine squared of alpha um, minus sine squared of alpha. In fact, we can do this without Desmos. Let's do that. Let's use some trig identities. I feel like I need to give ourselves a little bit more space here, so I'm going to move some things around. Get that up out of the way. Let's put that up here. Let's get this even more out of the way. There we go. All right, we're going to do some uh, double angle identities here. This is just cosine squared of alpha minus sine squared of alpha plus i times, and then sine of 2 alpha is the same thing as 2 sine of alpha cosine of alpha. All right, and then we get, we're going to use our uh, reference triangle that we're going to, I'm going to extract a reference triangle here with angle alpha. You know, knowing that this is uh, 2, 1, and this is alpha, we know this is radical 5. Right? right, just with z here, z is at that point right there. Now this reference triangle will help us do cosine of alpha. Cosine of, cosine of alpha is 2 over radical 5, but then square that. So we get uh, 4 fifths right here, minus sine squared is 1 over radical alpha, but then square that, it's 1 fifth plus i times uh, 2 times the sine of alpha, which is 1 over radical 5, times the cosine of alpha, which is 2 over radical 5. And where is this taking us? Let's see, we're almost done. Do this subtraction here. We get 3 fifths. And do all this multiplication. That winds up being 4 fifths. And then there's times an i. I'll put that there at the end. All right, radical 5 times radical 5, All right, that just becomes 5, and 2 times 1 times 2 just makes the 4, so we have 4 fifths there, times i. Then distribute the whole half through there, and we get 3 tenths plus uh, 2 fifths, or you can say 4 tenths, i. There it is. There is our w. Now, of course, the other approach that I illustrated earlier was that, well, if, if u is going to be equal to z divided by w, then multiply by w divided by u, then we know that w should be equal to z divided by u, and we know what z is, it's 2 plus i, we know what u is, it's 4 minus 2i, and when you multiply by conjugates, I'll let you do this on your own, you should be able to show that you get the same result here. Uh, I will leave that to you to show. But these are some of the geometric interpretations of uh, you know, working with uh, complex numbers that are in polar form and knowing what happens when you multiply and divide two complex numbers 
what happens to the magnitude of the result and also to the uh, argument of the result. In the case of multiplication, you add the arguments, and in the case of division, you subtract the arguments. Okay, and that wraps up uh, 10.3.